Okay, folks, Sean Cobra here with you, and we've got a great guest on today, uh, Gary Leindecker. He's a very educated man uh, I've known for a few years, uh, retired from the state uh, a few years back, and he's really into math. So uh, he, a few weeks ago, I seen some stuff he put on Facebook uh, talking about the virus, and I figured we'd get a hold of him and see what he's been up to and uh, kind of see what he did with, with his graph. And uh, Gary, can you kind of tell us a little bit what you what you've been up to? Sure, I I, uh, I like to play around with things, and I've been interested in coronavirus for a month and a half. Probably started taking it seriously when I was with the Missouri Department of Mental Health. We were looking at SARS and MERS for a while, and I was tracking those things, and they got relatively quickly under control. With this, it looked like it was out of control for quite a while in China. And it made me concerned, so I started started looking at the data. So really, just a, a less than a week ago, I built the, a, a, a very simple data model. I'm, the mathematics in this is nothing uh, special, and I I just looked at the exponential growth uh, that I assumed was going to be there, and in fact, that's what I found. I ended up modeling data for the U.S., for Italy, France, and Germany just for comparison, but I was mostly interested in the U.S. And uh, the model is very simple. I had all the new cases from uh, February 15th on, I think February 15th, uh, I, I think the, the correct data is that that was when our first 15 cases were identified, or they may have been identified earlier, but that's what showed up on the, the charts I was using on info world or worldinfo.com. Um, but the, the growth in the first a uh, week or two weeks was real variable. It was zero, you know, 15 one day, zero a bunch of days, 20 another day, zeros, 18, four, three, zero. So very small numbers. But around March 1st or, or uh, uh, February 29th, there started to develop a pattern. And so what I did was look at the data from uh, March 29th through March 15th and and just fit a an exponential model to that which is just means each day's total is the the original day's total I mean, excuse me the previous day's total times a factor a constant factor and in this case when i fit the data it was to find out tomorrow's uh, total cases you multiply today's total cases by 1.305 that's what fit the data um, now, that number, I, I said when I published it and put it on Facebook and told it to some friends, is just, it's what fit those two weeks. <laughs> and what it does is it gives me then a projection for future days, which just show what an exponential growth curve would look like at that rate. It's not a prediction that that's what's going to happen. It just means if we continue growing at that rate, that's what would happen. So I've tracked it for several days since then and and can see some patterns. Yeah, obviously there's a lot of factors that go into this uh, in breaking that pattern up. Uh, but as we've seen over in China, uh, Italy, Germany, uh, basically around the world, this thing is spreading like wildfires. Um, obviously, That's... if it's getting the attention of you guys, I mean, this is what you've done for a living, um, the department and such, but uh, where do you see this going or, or what do you recommend? <clears throat> well, first of all, I recommend we take seriously the, the what the experts have been saying all along. Unfortunately, not what has been the official pronouncements, uh, but the, the experts, uh, including uh, Dr. Fochi, who speaks for often when uh, President Trump's on, he he is wise, knows what he's talking about, and and he and other experts have said for a long time that this is very serious. It's going to get very big, and uh, it's we need to do everything we can to uh, mitigate, to slow the spread. And I don't know if you've seen the flattening the curve uh, discussions. Basically, people expect this will spread to a a high percentage of the U.S. population, from as low as maybe 10 or 20 percent up to 60 or 70 percent. 
Um, but the question is how fast it goes. If it goes and makes a big curve like that, it overwhelms the healthcare system and a lot of people die unnecessarily. That's what happened in China at first. They've got it under control at this point. Um, their, their new cases are in the less than 50 a day for a while now. Um, in the U.S., we're still in that exponential growth curve. And unfortunately, from the day I uh, put out the numbers first on the 15th, we are now, let's see, I had predicted, I mean, excuse me, the model would have predicted 10,700 new cases approximately by today or by the end of the day yesterday. In fact, we have 13,000, about 800. So it's actually, so it's growing. It's exceeding. It's growing normal. quite a bit. Yes. And, and the daily ratios, I also keep track of, and it's, it's up a lot instead of 1.3 times. Yesterday was 1.49 times the previous day. The day, the previous day was 1.44 times the previous day. So we're actually growing it. That rate is growing a lot. So this is what I wanted to do was get this out here so that people could see what exponential growth looks like and and what it would predict or what it would lead toward. And so what, one of the things I said when I, I put some stuff out was based on the data and the model and the 15th and the growth rate I had by uh, March 22, which would be one week later, we'd have 23,765 cases. We're going to exceed that by a mile. I mean, at least 10,000 of that. And this uh, is by the next. Go ahead. Sorry. And I was saying this is all based on the testing that we have available to us. This isn't even that's right. That, that's right. And there, there's there's some misleading things about reality versus the data we have. And that is the reality right now is worse than the data because we don't we're not testing a lot of people. So if we could test everybody, we'd see an awful lot more cases. And as testing comes online this week, I think more people are getting testing. There are still shortages. I know uh, our local situation is uh, still very short. They're not testing a lot of people who they would test if they had enough availability. Uh, but some places have plenty of tests. So I have a friend in New Mexico, and they've been doing testing for quite a while because their governor uh, began the process back about four weeks ago of planning for this. Um, anyway, the other thing I'd said again on the 15th was that by the 29th, that would be two weeks later, we would have in the U.S. 153,000 cases. This is the exponential growth going from about 3,700 to uh, 24,000 to 153,000 in, in over a period of two weeks. And I think people don't realize that is what would happen if you had an exponential growth rate that we had, and it looks like we're gonna have more. And like you point out, with further testing, with increased testing, the numbers in the near term will go up. Once we get ahead of the curve on testing, and uh, if not too many people have overwhelmed the hospitals, then we have a chance to start to bring it down. The problem is, as in Italy now, my understanding is there are places, especially Northern Italy, but some others, where the hospital system is overwhelmed and you literally, uh, doctors are having to do triage when somebody comes in and they're a low probability of making it and there's limited resources, they are, are told we can't help you. Yeah, we're, uh, seeing, we're, seeing that, we're seeing that around the world and I think that's what obviously the United States is trying to avoid. Um, your background in this, you've seen this over the years, uh, working working within the government and just, just being alive, seeing things happen. Can you talk about uh, a little bit of your background? Uh, like you said, you, you this isn't your first time tracking things. So, I mean, you've got quite a background. Well, but my background, I mean, I, again, I don't claim to be an expert. I'm, I just know some mathematics and I like to do modeling. And so when SARS came out uh, and later MERS, uh, I was with the Missouri Department of Mental Health and we were doing some uh, scenario uh, enactments and preparation in case of that or anthrax or other things that they were concerned about and how that would affect our uh, operations, including the hospitals 
that the department runs. So on my own, not officially, I just uh, built a similar kind of spreadsheet model to see what was happening. And again, the first few weeks in low numbers, it looked like uh, both of those was blowing up. But what happened in each of those cases is uh, they were able to figure out how to control it uh, much easier. And those, it turns out there are, there are factors in the diseases that make them less likely, more likely to be controllable than this is. This is a, my understanding, and this, I'm not an expert here, but my understanding is the problem here is you have a little longer incubation period where you may be contagious and not have symptoms. That's a bad thing. Also, it takes it can take an average of 14 days from when you are, that's the number I've seen most recently, from when you are, uh, when you have symptoms to when you are either cured or dead, mostly cured. Uh, and during that time, you're contagious. So there's a long window of contagion, including some where you don't know you have anything. And so that makes it very hard to, uh, to get ahead of. Uh, so I modeled those other things, and, and after a couple of weeks, you could see that it was going off that exponential path and then slowing down, and, and they got ahead of it and stopped it. Uh, without vaccines, it was really just with treatment. Here, you know, they're trying to do vaccines, but that's more than a year out, according to the experts. Uh, the treatment options uh, could come online sooner, but not. The experts are still saying it's it's a few months before we have treatment options that uh, that might make a difference. We, yeah, they, that can change. Yeah, they've been experimenting with some different drugs that they've already been using um, to, to yes. see if that works. It, and like you said, that's right. They don't. Go ahead. Well, like you said, they really don't know what the case is. Um, yes. I, I feel like at, any, at this point, the whole world's throwing whatever they can at it, obviously. Um, yeah. And I mean, that's good. You want to throw, yeah. throw out every med that you think could have a, a, a chance of uh, reducing symptoms and stuff. And if they do that, there's a fair chance we'll find some that are at least marginally effective, you know. Even if they just reduce symptoms a certain percentage, then it means medium serious cases can be kept out of the hospital. Serious cases might be kept uh, off ventilators and so on. So, uh, and mild cases are already okay. So, now, when looking at the world and seeing what other countries are doing, um, obviously there's the borders have been shut in a majority of countries, uh, but. What do you? What are your thoughts on trying to keep this, keep this uh, without growing? I mean, we're talking about exponential growth, but could there be exponential um, non-growth? I guess uh, I don't know how, what you would call that, but I, how do we turn that around? I think what's been shown in China, and to some extent, probably in South Korea, and we're we're hoping that's coming up in in Italy. Um, is that absolute, you know, either legal uh, legal requirements to stay inside or at least strong encouragement to, to really not get out except for vital uh, activities. That's what China literally locked down the town of 16 million. People were not supposed to leave their homes except for specific purposes and they were monitored they had police out they uh, you know they enforced it in ways that we would probably not accept here Most italy definitely. is doing that now we've got italy is doing that now we they got, have police on the streets we've got video uh out of china and italy that show them actually welding the doors of some of these apartment buildings shut uh use, oh my goodness yeah uh using using uh dump trucks and dumping debris on the roads to keep people from traveling on the roads. Yeah. Uh, these are very, uh, you know, if this happened in the United States, uh, you'd probably see mass hysteria possibly. But like yeah. you said, yeah. there is there is a seriousness in China. Um, and as of the last few days, they've actually been kicking out American journalists. So there is some yes. reports that maybe their numbers are not what they're really reporting. That's um, a possibility. And so... Uh, 
I mean, as, as far as your math background, when you see something like this in China where they have over 80,000 uh, infected uh, a few months ago to the point where they have one, do, do you see a, uh, something wrong with the numbers just with the math? Or, or do you think that's possible to, for them to overcome something like that? My understanding, they're, they're, the, the, what's down to one or few now is new, uh, new cases. So the, the total cases is over 80, so that's, that's going up all the time. But uh, they, I think, you know, it was one province that, where they had the vast majority of their problems, and that's the one where it got out ahead of them. The other provinces had much lower rates because when they shut down the primary city and province, they put strict controls, maybe not the same, on the other regions, and apparently they had testing and enforcement, and they also, I'd heard, I'd read, <clears throat> that they had something like 1,500 teams of five people who for every identified uh, infected case, they would try to track down all the previous contacts in the previous week or more and, and get those people isolated. So that's very strong uh, tracking down and getting people isolated because isolation works. I mean, that's the, it doesn't keep that group from getting it, but it keeps it from going out from an isolated group. Uh, so I, I know there are some questions about their numbers and I've, I've heard a lot of questions about Iran's numbers now. Uh, but I, I do believe that China has both the willpower and the authority to impose what we would call draconian uh, constraints on, on movement. But uh, I think it was, it was yesterday or today that, that uh, California has imposed almost the same thing. A couple of days ago, they, they did it on uh, San Mateo and another county, which was uh, you were not supposed to be out except for a certain, uh, certain essential jobs, medicine, and uh, groceries, basically that's it. And we have a friend out there who says, there are police, they are giving warnings at this point. Uh, that was yesterday, giving warnings, not tickets or arrest <laughs> or anything, but uh, they're really enforcing. And I think we're gonna see that in some other states. You know, it's, I wouldn't be surprised if it comes to New York State soon. It's already sort of close in the city, I think. Most definitely. Uh, uh, with with your background, I know that not to get political with any of this, but there there was talk of this going on for quite some time before we really took uh, uh, the precautions to even close the border. Uh, even within our own state, um, you see yes. a lot of the restaurants saying that they're open still, doing the delivery. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, these are these are just to me, it's more of a uh, a way to spread it. I, I really don't see they're not taking it serious what I've seen in the rest of the world. Uh, the United States and well, they, I, I don't really mean this to be uh, to verge into political, but at, it's absolutely true that President Trump down downplayed uh, everything about this until the 16th. He never admitted this was serious until the 16th and made a lot of statements that it was going away and it was minor and we'd, you know, we were doing everything perfect. Well, that that is cost because some of his um, political followers then believed this was, you know, a creation of somebody else or an exaggeration and and some people are still in denial that this is serious. Um, yeah, there's I a think, lot. There's I a lot of denial. If you get online. There's a lot of denial. Yeah. There's all kinds of conspiracies. There's uh, the Chinese, Russian, Iran, uh, New World yes. Order uh, people are talking about. Uh, there, there's, there's all kinds of stuff. They're basically saying that the market is back to before Trump was president. Yeah. They've erased everything. Uh, yeah. There's all kinds of theories out there. Uh, but what we do know is this was going on. There were reports uh, in December of 2019. First cases were in December, yes. 2019. First cases were in December, yep. 
Uh, and and we... Or sorry. There were people in the U.S. The, there were people in the U.S. within government, but not at the top, who were raising this as a serious issue in December, you know, saying we needed to we needed to be prepared for what, in fact, has happened. I want to add one other thing. You mentioned the conspiracies. Uh, I did read uh, the synopsis of a research paper that's actually scientific research. They have done uh, analysis of the DNA in, in this virus and determined by two different means of, of two different aspects of the DNA that this is not a man-made or manipulated uh, virus. And I, I don't understand the particulars enough, but, but again, this is a, a, a real study. Uh, and it said, you know, these, the idea that either China was doing something and released it on purpose or by mistake, or that the U.S. did, or that someone else did, those are just simply not going to turn out to be factual. They're, the, they, have, they can look at the virus and see patterns in that that <coughs> match that would not be that way had they been manipulated. Again, I don't, I can't vouch for that myself, but this was a reputable uh, study by <laughs> serious people. And I think that's what we're going to find out. I think this kind of thing happens. SARS, MERS, this happens and it will happen again. Most of those little variations that give us some new illness are not this way. This one just happens to fit us. They said there are two possibilities. One is that there was a, a, a change in the virus within an animal that allowed it to jump over and was dangerous to humans. The other was that there was enough of a, a change in the virus that it jumped to a human and that was within humans, which it could have been carried around for a while without effects, but that there was a change then that made it dangerous. It's one of those two things, and it's, you know, it, it, according to this, it's just simply not a, a man manipulation thing. So I think that, I think those are conspiracy theories that, that we make up to account for what happens in real life, but that we don't want to accept that that's really, you know, that's the, that's the way we live. Yeah, the latest I heard was it, it may have started from a bat and then it got into a, a pangolin? Pangolin, yeah, that's that's what they sort of think. But that, again, I think they're not certain of that, but that's that's a path they, they think is likely. But, uh, and you might know this more than obviously I do, but uh, it's they were, they're thinking it came from an open market and they also think, isn't that where SARS and, and, yes. and MERS yeah. came from as well? Yeah, there are people that say that that's a, a <clears throat> that the selling of live animals in markets like that, which happens not just in China but a lot of places, in uh, uh, not in the U.S. and most countries that we uh, think of as developed, but uh, that that's a dangerous, that's a dangerous uh, way to operate. It's uh, it's too easy for something to jump. You know, we're going to see that we had we had the swine flu, which uh, originated in pigs somehow and got to humans, which is a very easy jump. Uh, but so things will happen either way. Uh, I mean, it'll get to humans from other sources somewhere along the line, but there are people who really believe that uh, the fresh or live meat markets are particularly dangerous. Yeah. So it's probably quality. So based on your your math and kind of your research and what's going on with the world, you were you were talking about um, the numbers in Italy. Uh, they may have, they might start be going down now. Is that what is that what you've? They're <clears throat> they're still in the last uh, five days. Their average increase was about uh, the previous days times one point one three, which would be you know about. Uh, eight percent bigger than I mean, thirteen percent bigger than the previous day. That's for new cases. That still means their total caseload is growing a lot. Grew over eleven hundred cases uh, between the day before yesterday and yesterday. But that rate is significantly slower than it had been. The rate that they had been was already slower than our rate has been. But uh, so their their pre the prediction I had for them by. Uh, the 22nd was 188,000. That's what the model would have gone to. 
I'm I'm betting it's uh, below a hundred thousand and maybe maybe below fifty thousand. It's it's much lower than that at this point. There, well, no, it won't be below fifty thousand, but it it will be below a hundred thousand, I think. So that's a lot fewer cases than it could have been. Uh, and we and, saw and we saw that reduction as soon as they started keeping people inside. Is that well, well actually? What And one of the things I've got in my model is I've marked dates at which each country did something. You know, for instance, actually, Italy, back on January 31st, closed their uh, travel from China to, to their country. They recognized that right among the earliest countries, like uh, our president brags about that was, you know, the key thing he saved us millions of death. China, I mean, Italy did that before we did it. It didn't seem to do the job. But Italy put in the uh, serious constraints on movement on the 7th for the northern part of Italy and on the 9th for the whole country. We are now a uh, little over 10 days from the first action and about, what, eight or nine, 10 days from the second. We're 12 days from the first. Oh, I turned it off. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, we're good. Okay, another call came in, but I, I, I told him I wouldn't take it. So, um, so these actions that that Italy did to really close things down in the north and in the country are like ten and twelve days ago. That's the period of time that it takes to really start to uh, to see the effects of that action. Now, it happened sooner than that, but they had been doing some things sooner, but. As, as another week goes by, that that gives you a good chance of holding it down. So I'd look at a, a week to two weeks after some action is when you're likely to first see s some significant effect. That's, that's my observation. I don't know enough to say that. I see it in this data, and I've, I, I see it in a couple of other spots. So, uh, and that, that's consistent with the, uh, the incubation period and the period that you could be ill being between like five days or 14 days. So you'd expect those things to start to show up in the data of new cases uh, a week or so afterwards. And that's what that's what I think I'm seeing. Again, uh, this is just, this is seat of my pants, look at the data that I've got. Yeah, it's very, it's very interesting how America is kind of reacting to it. Um, we always kind of act like we're the top dogs on no matter what situation, yes. even though we're only about 360 million people yeah. compared to uh, the 7.6 billion people in the world, we've always got yes. that that lead role. But um, obviously, we're not in a position to recreate the wheel here, and we need to be looking at what is going on in these other countries and how they've uh, kind of reacted and what to do and what not to do. Um, do you? I mean, I know this is you know, controversial, but the, the stopping of people moving, it seems like it's the only thing we have to keep this thing from growing. Is, is yeah. that what your thoughts that, are? That's the main thing. The other piece of that, though, is if you can do testing of everybody that you'd want to, that is everybody that may have been exposed or who has symptoms. If you can do that, then you know people who really have to be uh, kept isolated. And that's what China did, and that's what uh, South Korea did. They tested, they've tested many times what we have, and and so they were testing tons of people and making sure that they figured out uh, who already had the virus or might have might have been exposed to it, and targeting them for uh, treatment as well as isolation. And so we we're going blind without the testing, and we are only now starting to implement the kind of isolation that we probably need to. You know, we're gonna see another thing I observed, again, it's not in my data, but it's uh, looking at some things from other states. I think we're gonna see significant difference between states. I mentioned uh, New Mexico uh, apparently has, has been prepared. I have a friend who lives there. He says they have multiple drive-through testing stations have been operating for like a week. 
They've tested several thousand people, whereas a lot of states their size have tested a few hundred. They are testing enough people that they've only had about 2% of the tested people turn out positive. So their criteria for testing is much lower than we've seen. I don't know where they're getting their test kits. They're doing more testing than they can go through their labs right now, but they, they're speeding that up. So because that governor and whoever she worked with was proactive, uh, they're getting, they're, they're, they're seeing where they are now and they'll, uh, I think they'll react. I think their results will be much better. The, the results are gonna, you know, first of all, it's how many total people get it, but it's also that curve of if you can, if you can make it happen slowly, then uh, the healthcare and the resources for them can kind of keep up. It's when, it's when it gets overwhelmed, you, people die that don't need to die. Well, and, and people get very sick that don't need to get very sick. Yeah, this is an unprecedented world event. Uh, you know, we, there's been massive uh, viruses that have killed the population over and over um, throughout history. And we're kind of going through that right now, but we've got technology that's allowing everybody to communicate. Um, that's right. Something that's never been done. And uh, it makes it scary. Sorry. It Go makes ahead. us what? It makes it scarier to know right now we can sit here and know what's happening across the world. So that's scarier. The other side, though, is it's tremendous advantage. I mean, we, again, if we'd have paid attention correctly, we could have been a week or two ahead of this curve of where we are now. And and so could other countries. And, and a lot of countries still can do that if they have resources. The problem is going to be when this gets to countries without resources, I don't know how they'll stop it. Well, and that's what I've been, uh, tell, I've been telling people for the last probably a month and a half ago. Um, we came out with reporting some stories on this and, and we, you know, got labeled crazy uh, way yeah. a long time ago, been labeled crazy. And, uh, we were just looking at what was going on in the world. We, I, I worked in the university setting for years and have friends all over the world and they were sending yeah. me video, uh, verified video. And then we were getting unverified video, hundreds of unverified videos from around the world and, um, wow. all kind of painting the same picture, uh, from, from multiple countries, not just, uh, out of China, yeah. but we had yeah. video from, uh, Italy yep. and uh, some stuff out of uh, Iran. Uh, NASA actually released some uh, photos of Iran uh, showing some mass graves that they have built. Uh, and then I had some other video actually of being in that cemetery some people shot. Um, so yeah. it, was, it was two different sources. Actually, it was three different sources. We had a couple different videos. Uh, and then with NASA reporting, uh, they could see it from space. This, this, the length of this, this great, obviously yeah. they've got really long lenses on those, on those satellites, but, yeah. um, yeah. it's interesting just how each country is reacting. And, and like you said, each state, uh, you know, at first we were all kind of waiting for Trump to react. And then you seen yeah. some governors demand, yeah. uh, the, gov yes. the military to come in, uh, such as in New York. Uh, and then, you know, you got the state of Washington, uh, with that nursing home and, uh, you know, I've got a friend, yes. I've got a friend an hour away in that County and she's been, and she's from the lake and, uh, she's been trying to give people information too. Cause a lot of people, us being here in the Midwest, it's probably a good thing at the moment, yes, but, it is th now. It but there's a lot of stuff on the coast. The East coast is really seeing it. And, uh, up north, the northwest coast, and obviously the 40 million people in California that are all sitting in their houses right now. Um, yeah. Do you have any advice from previous, th you know, being with the health department? You, just, just some maybe tips. Well, you, men you mentioned that. Let me jump back to one other thing first. But uh, you mentioned uh, situations in the past, and uh, I believe that most experts say. This is beyond anything we've had since the Spanish flu in 1918, 19. That killed something like, I may be wrong in this. I, my, my brain is saying 20 million people, but it, it might be a different number. Um, we could easily go way past that in the world and, you know, by, by an order of magnitude or more. 
so uh, it's it's really this is the event of our lifetime. If we thought 9/11 or uh, the 2008 crash were big, this is uh, probably probably bigger. It's going to be a tremendous adjustment both for getting past the virus, which is going to take until a vaccine's out to really feel confident. Uh, and and the economic impact is uh, totally undetermined, but it's it's going to be amazing, amazingly difficult. And again, uh, then you mentioned the uh, the other your question. You, you said Department of Health, but I was in the Department of Mental Health, which is different. Uh, and so we didn't normally look at uh, epidemics or something like that. Again, we did for this those particular cases. We were concerned because of the effect what they would have. And one of the things I could say is in the simulations that we did, we did a, a department-wide simulation of sort of leaders of uh, various of our facilities and our divisions and departments, including the IT group. And we talked about the, um, the difficulties of enforcing things like, uh, like isolation or uh, travel restrictions, uh, talked about the problem of uh, caretakers and, and irreplaceable people getting uh, either very sick or actually ha dying. So, you know, your medical people and in our department, it would have been everybody that works in direct care of the staff. Uh, but then it goes all the way back to leadership in the department as, you know, if certain people were out of commission, it, it really... Uh, really starts to damage the, the ability for the department to take care of those people. And so uh, I, have a, I have a son-in-law who, uh, I'm, who helps, he oversees the, the care for developmentally di disabled adults in, uh, adults in two counties here in Kansas. And they are in uh, a very concerned mode both about the people they take care of who are often at risk and their staff, which they're normally overworked and relatively underpaid, but uh, it's, it's gonna be a real challenge for people like that to, to keep going. So I'm, I'm glad if the, the government does something to help, the federal government does something to uh, ease the financial risk of, of some people who may lose work or even part time, who knows what you know the, the effects will be. Uh, I think this is it, it. Really does call for all all hands on deck. Well, and a lot of a lot of people are, are talking about the economics of it, and you know you hear people I'm that they're saying my business is ruined, everything's ruined, and they've kind of got that idea of we can't stop everything because we got to keep the system going. Uh, yeah. But from what I see, is, and I understand that, I understand that, you know, people are running businesses yeah. and stuff, but if we don't solve yeah. this problem, they're not going to have a business to even keep going is what I see in what I've seen around the world. Um, I think, I think that's right. And I actually, I actually, you know, this is my skepticism about uh, our current leadership, but I think it was only the stock market recognizing the real uh, threat to the country's economy, when it started plummeting, that is when uh, our president changed his tune on the 16th. Uh, until then, it was only about people, and it, that didn't seem to, he was able to just say, well, we'll get past that. But when the market went down 20%, that got attention of people who, Apparently, we're worried a little less. I have to say, I read I read an article, and I I had thought of this. I had wondered. There are people who are saying, I don't think it's a, a common belief, but there are people who are saying the damage to our economy is going to be so great that we should have just go on with business, don't worry about it, let people get sick, maybe several million people die, but the economy keeps going. You know, obviously, there's going to be an impact of people dying, but you know, we could survive with 300 and you know, 40 million instead of 342 million or whatever it is, people. So there are people who are actually saying 
keeping the economy going was more important or should be more important than uh, worrying about lives, especially lives of old people, uh, which is, you know, about half of the people that die are the ones over 65 or something. Yeah. So that, you're uh, you're right. That's that's a that's an attitude. Uh, and I think you you've got to rec- you've got to recognize the tremendous financial problems that are going to result from this. But unless you're willing to just say, let them go, uh, we're going to pay that price. Well, I think that's where the the new wave of problems are going to come from, right? I mean, the vast majority of this country's products are imported and imported from very few places, even though we might assemble them here. The the actual product, the hard product is made a lot of times over in China. And uh, they were, you know, they've been shut down. So uh, this whole economy thing, I mean, it's it's a wave, right? And, And we're kind of the last person to feel yes. it. We've got these oceans that are That's kind right. of blocking everything. And we're going to we're going to see that uh, China again, I think they're getting ahead of it and their percentage of their population they lost because they're so giant is relatively small. If they can stay ahead of it, they can continue to produce. I mean, they can get back to production. If when this gets to some of the smaller, less developed countries where we have moved manufacturing from China to those countries. Those countries are not going to be able to handle it as well as it is. And I've already read, and you've probably seen this too, there are uh, major manufacturers in the U.S. I think the one I read about was Apple, but it may have been somebody else. They are already shifting production from some locations in foreign countries to others that may be less disrupted. The trouble is, wherever you move it now, they are very likely to be disrupted when the wave hits them. So I think we're going to see exactly what you're talking about, that with us being at the consuming end, uh, the big consumers at the end of the uh, manufacturing t- pipeline of the world, uh, we will. that's all going to run downhill, and, and some of the stuff we expect to have is not going to be available or it's going to be expensive. Or we're going to catch on and move some things back here and, figure out there's an advantage of that. Yeah, I think that's what you're starting to see in some places uh, is this idea that maybe it's not good to have uh, that, that cheaper product, but maybe the the ability to produce our own. Um, Absolutely. And we've seen that. In... Go ahead. No, oh, like you said, I mean, this is all history rewrote, rerun. Yeah. Uh, just more generations that forget the past. Um, I always, I always just think of the, uh, back when they used to deliver salt on camels and, uh, being, being the first trade route in China and stuff and, and how it all kind of started and where we are today. And we don't want to look back at how things started or how things are. We just want that product in that store. And, uh, I think that attitude is, is going to bite us. This this is going to be a learning experience for on multiple levels. I think, you know, economically, we will probably learn some lessons about uh, what we need to or want to maintain local control of. And it's not just us. Other countries are going to see some of those same things. I think the other thing, uh, you know, I try to read some enlightening news or encouraging news. And there are people who are saying, you know, this is this is an opportunity where we will notice that everything that we want, we actually don't need a lot of it. You know, we're we're saying you only need to get out to get, you know, key things. If you've got food, shelter, medical care, you know, you're you're okay. Uh, we don't have to get our new TV the day we feel like it, or order from Amazon and get, you know, a new speaker system uh, three days later. Uh, we, we want those things and we like them, but that doesn't matter as much. So we may understand some values a little differently. The other is that I think we'll discover uh, that people working together, even ones we disagree with, even people, you know, somebody across the road that uh, is a different uh, race, religion, uh, political ideology, everything different, uh, we are more likely to help each other than we were three weeks ago. 
and and I think that's going to I think that's going to be a good thing in the end, as long as we can avoid devolving into a real mess. I mean, a, a social breakdown, which you know that's the outside possibility too, and that that would be horrendous. Um. Is there anything else you'd like to say, uh, or how can people reach these graphs you got? Uh, do you plan on putting out more, or, or where's that? I I I I only plan to update. Uh, it, it's a Facebook post. Uh, I can make it visible to anybody. Um, and my name is Gary Leindecker, L Y N D A K E R. I'll be the only one on the internet, uh, and uh, I think. I think that can be visible to anybody. Uh, the problem is, I don't want, I don't want people to say this is, you know, this is a, anything other than what it is, which is just a very simple model of the exponential growth for a period of time, and and then the projections of that out a few weeks, because it will, it will let us see, are we doing better than those rates, which are already terribly high rates of growth of new cases. Uh, when we when will we turn the corner? You'll start to see that in terms of a, a lower growth rate and then hopefully a decreasing rate. And that's 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 what it's about. Uh, so again, I just repeat, I'm not an expert. I'm only somebody who who took the data that's right out there and made the simplest possible model to illustrate the exponential growth and what we are in for if we don't do something different. If we do worse, we'll, we'll end up worse than those predictions. If we do that well, uh, one of those predictions, uh, I mean, one of those things, let me see. I'll pull up my data if I can find it here. Well, that's something, uh, I mean, like, like you said, there's no rocket science. There's no magic behind it. You're doing simple math. No. no. It's simple math that really this, describes what's going on. It, in this one, I'll just say, if you go out till April 12th on the U.S. model, at, if we stayed at the rate of growth we were at on the 15th of this month, and you go ahead four weeks, we would have over 6 million people infected. That's, that's a lot. If you went one more week at that rate, we'd have 41 million people infected. Now, that won't happen because, I hope, uh, as you have more people who are infected and then uh, cured, which most of them are, 95 to 99% are going to be cured, as they become back in the, the population who aren't ill now, they can't, we think, they can't catch it again. That's still up in the air a little bit, but in general we believe they won't catch it again. So, so it can't grow as fast at some point. Uh, so we won't we won't get to that number, but we we could get to millions infected very easily. And when it gets to millions, you will know lots of people who are ill, and most of them will have it mild. Some will go to the hospital. Some will end up on respirators, ventilators, and some will die. So that's that's what this model was just just to show the the road we were on. It's I. I I know we won't be on that road. Uh, that lo I, I think in four weeks we'll diverge from that by quite a bit, but it remains to be seen when we start to uh, do enough to to really diverge from that. I think if I were president, if I were you know, I think we should do a near legal. Uh, isolation for everybody now, almost like California is doing, you know, say, uh, if you're out, you have to only be out for these purposes. I have a brother that lives in Strasbourg, France. He's been there for decades. Uh, they have to fill out a form. I believe it's online when they can, otherwise a paper form that tells where they're, if they're leaving their home or apartment, they have to fill out a form that says where they're going and what the purpose is. And the purpose can be medical, groceries, or, or critical supplies, or uh, work if it's one of these certain categories of essential work. Otherwise, they can go out for exercise, but there's 
they can't go far. They can stay in their neighborhoods. They can't drive 10 miles away and walk around. So that's that went into effect, I think, two days ago. And uh, uh, that's maybe more than we should do, but we should be we should be closer to that than just saying you're encouraged to stay in. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, countries that are using uh, the cell phone technology to basically track yeah. track the people wherever they go. Uh, That's my understanding. China did, yeah. Yeah, I, I know a lot of people in this country may chalk it up as Big Brother, but uh, at this point, we need all the tracking possible. I know there's websites being thrown up all over the United States tracking it. Um, we've had a couple sites we've been using, and it's... it's uh, a month ago, there was it was the state of Washington. You know, we saw yeah, some stuff out of New right. York, and now you can slowly right. see it taking over the whole country. And obviously, it's yeah, been here. We just haven't been able to test for it. That's right. That's right. And um, it, it probably hasn't been here in tremendous numbers, but it's certainly it's certainly been here. What the way it pops up, like New York, certain areas of Colorado, a few other places, it suddenly goes from just a few to a whole bunch, and that means. That whole bunch, just a few means somebody came there who had been exposed. When it pops into a whole bunch, that means you're getting local transmission. And it's that local transmission that is the driver of the real, the high rate of change. Yep. Well, Gary, well, I'm glad, I'm, I appreciate you getting in touch with me, Sean. And uh, this is, it's interesting. Uh, it's scary. It's interesting. Uh, it's a major event in our lives. Yeah, I mean, we're just trying to put out information. I, I like I said, I saw you on Facebook. I saw you were putting out some models, and I, I, I know you're a really smart brain, and that's what we need more in this life or this world is uh, people using uh, common sense and, and just math. Basic math can solve a lot of things in life, and if you use well, those, at least, and if you use those, it can, it can give us a picture. Yep. And in using right. those models, like you said, we'll paint the picture of what where we're going or where we've been. And a lot of people are in denial of that, but it's not rocket science and it's not magic. It's just simple math. Yeah. And the, the rocket science and magic is in the in the healthcare field right now. For the rest of us, it is pretty simple if we if we understand and then take care. Well, I appreciate your time, and uh, we'll we'll be talking with you soon, hopefully. All right. Thanks a lot, Sean. Bye bye. Bye. You stay healthy. Yeah. Bye. You too.